Arcast, your podcast about IT architecture, is starting now. Hi Arc, is everything 100% with you? In today's content, we're going to talk about a topic that many people ask me about and have questions about. In fact, architects even have a lot of questions regarding layers and layer responsibilities. And I decided to do an Arcast about this topic which was specifically requested by one of the people who commented on our podcasts. Okay, so, uh, I'm bringing this format. It's been a while since we posted anything on podcasts, right? We're going to start posting our casts more frequently too, okay? Well, first of all, if you're just landing here and don't know me, nice to meet you. My name is Carlos Pisani, I'm the CEO of ARC a company focused on solution architecture, software, and systems. We're focused on architecture, okay? We're an architectural consultant and we also teach and help professionals become architects, okay? And if you are interested in this type of subject, if you want to become an architect too or if you are already an architect and like this subject, click on the button below. Sign up right now and subscribe to the channel, right? For you or depending on the media you are following us on, follow us. Why? Because we release content like this which is focused on professionals who want to take the next step in their career, towards architecture or who are already architects and want to become even better in the field. Well, uh, in this podcast format, for those who don't know, we don't have much material, okay, to share here. We will, it's more of a direct chat. And today we are going to talk about layer responsibilities. This is a very interesting topic, okay? It's a little more theoretical, actually, but it's really cool, right? And a lot of people have doubts. Because what happens when we talk about layer responsibilities? You get into that question of why does it have a name? For example, facade, the layer. Why does it have a name of two? Why does it have a name and entity? Why not two and entity, right? Why did you choose one or the other? So, today we're going to talk a little bit about what each of these layers is, right? Their responsibilities. I brought 15 here. I have the cheat sheet, right? So, we're going to talk about them one by one. First, I'm going to use the cheat sheet. Then we'll go into detail, talking a little bit about our career experience, how we actually applied each of them in the market. So, quite a long content, but I'm sure it will add a lot of value to you. So, let's go. Arcast, your podcast about IT architecture. The first layer. I brought here for us to discuss is the core layer. Well, what is the core layer? What is it for? Typically, we've been seeing it increasingly applied, right, in architecture designs, architects using it more and more. This is a layer that is typically, as the name suggests, right? The core, the heart of the application. It's that layer that is responsible not only for business rules, right? Oftentimes, the business rules are even segmented, but when I use the core, I even bring the business rules part into it, okay? Typically, it's a layer that has the intelligence of the whole thing. It's the heart of the whole thing. So, for example, when I need to use, write, directly in a layer in a simpler architecture of a framework, write, this framework, for example, it may be encapsulating the use of several other layers, write, of several technologies, by the way. Well, and then I centralize it in it, right? Let's suppose I'm not using DDD, right? If I'm working with another architecture model, in this model, I centralize in it the responsibility of both executing the business rules part there, right? As well as the intelligence of orchestrating the technological issues. So, it calls the framework, it orchestrates the calls there of the framework, okay? So, I really like to use the core in this way. There are other architecture models that I've used, I've seen in my market, where it, for example, is part of another, right, another set of layers. I have data, I have business, and then I have the core, right? And the core is another layer that unifies, right, all the intelligence there to call, to orchestrate, for example, business rule layers. So, it can also be, okay? I have business layers that have use cases there, if you're working with hexagonal architecture, for example. Well, and then you can have a centralizing core layer, right, that unifies, for example, the execution of a functionality that is even greater than that, right, and that maybe it has to do external things, read from a queue or use a framework or use, anyway, some other resource that is not necessarily present there, right, in the architecture in a common way, right? Yeah, I think the rope is the most complex of the layers for us to talk about, because it can be implemented in several ways, okay? But keep in mind that when you give this name to a layer, 
eh, it is expected that it will have a very high relevance, okay? That it will either orchestrate business classes or that it will also have business responsibility for something that is critical, something that is perhaps the very heart of the business. The main functionality of the business is orchestrated by it, okay? Something along those lines, that's what a core layer is for, okay? Of course. EH, we usually give the name of the folder core, right? And inside there you will have a series of other EH classes, maybe even folders applying some kind of standard. We will talk about this too, right, that you can put it there, but it is a great segmentation of your system when you put the core, we already have it clear, right, it is delimited, that this is where we literally have the most important functionalities, okay. Well, next here, using my cheat sheet, our model layer. This layer here, it is a little simpler, right? It is normally used in architectural patterns such as MVC, MVVM, MVP and so on, right? Well, and it typically represents a business entity, right? Or a table, right? When you have a more database-oriented architecture, right? Where the name of the table is practically represented directly, one-to-one, -one, right? There is the name of the table and it is represented directly via an ORM, for example, and then it is already represented there in your code, right? When we have it like this, normally it is a model that arrives there in the front, right? Which is exactly the same as the table that is registered. Ah, Pasane, in my architecture that is not how it works. I have a model, maybe a domain or a part of a domain or more than one domain. Okay, it can be that too, right? Yes, it is possible for you to synthesize the data that will be transmitted. For example, to your front end and synthesize it in a model, right, which is received there by a service, for example, there in our tier, right, the front end. And there we effectively have a model, for example, using an MVC, right, the architectural pattern there in the front end. And then I have a model representing the data, okay, right, or is it an MVVM, right? I need the AVM there in the middle too to do the synchronization, right? And there could be, for example, even the use of a web socket to keep the data updated on both sides, right? Two ways there, right? That's one of the ways we have too, okay? So, all of these are possibilities, but typically what is important to keep in mind is that we are talking about a model, right? So, typically the code that I have in a model, right? It's exactly the database, that is, a composition of domains, as we said, right? It doesn't matter, it represents the data that will actually be worked on by other layers, a view, a controller, a VM, right? Or any other, okay. Well, let's go. Next layer, the controller layer. This one here, typically, we talk about it in MVC, right? And it's a layer that typically has the role, right? Its main responsibility is to orchestrate. It ends up being almost a core, right? It receives the data there, right? It receives a request, for example, it routes it, right? It receives an endpoint, it reaches it directly. And based on this endpoint, it will make a decision. Wait, what is the model that I need to load? It's this one, it's the model. So, it goes to the model, loads its data and then it uses a certain view. So, it gets model, sends B and delivers it, returns it. So, the controller is used to do this work, right, of determining which view or views. Maybe I have to deliver it to more than one view, right, or to a master view there, right, all composed, anyway. Or maybe it needs several models, maybe it's an end to end here too. So, it's the controller that does this, okay? It can be used for another purpose, too. It can be used too, okay? Maybe you have an architecture there that isn't MVC, okay? And then your controller, it has, for example, the responsibility of orchestrating the calls to business rules. I've seen, okay, architect, that instead of having a facade there, for example, right, a single entry point, you have a controller and then you have business layers behind it and data layers and other layers there, but the controller layer, right, then it needs to have this responsibility, it's more flexible than just a facade, for example, right? It literally has the responsibility to orchestrate according to an input, with an input parameterization, right, for it. It will determine where it goes, right, for the flow of information, right, where it goes, what will be loaded, what is returned. Many times it even handles it before returning it, okay? This is a controller, okay? Speaking of MVC, here the role is clear, okay?
another layer, this one here is very common, right? We always see it in applications, and sometimes I even see it being used in a kind of strange way, okay, you have to be a little careful. The business layer, this is a layer, right, that is responsible for the business, okay? So, there should be nothing technological in it. So, for example, log, you are going to put log in a business class, it doesn't make sense, right? The log has to be in a more extreme layer at the very beginning. It will call a business layer, right? The business layer, its purpose is not to orchestrate anything. You need an orchestration, you're going to put a controller, okay? You're going to put a controller or a core to do this. You're not going to put this directly in a business. One business calling another. That's a mistake, right? Normally, it's another layer that will do this mix, right? Of the business layers, okay? So, within a business, you can have these use cases there. You can have not only an input, right, but it can also have an output that's based on, right, event driven. Maybe I have an event from that class that triggers, look, a certain business rule happened, a business event happened here. So it triggers an action, right, that can be listened to by other layers and from there also propagated to be a treatment, right, here, right not only being, well, requested, right, it can also make a return, right, or an action, right, an active action from it. Possible through events, right? Logically, your technology has to support event triggering, right? It has to be typically object-oriented, okay? Well, this is a layer, it's very common, practically in all architectural design, we see the use of this layer, right? It's a very important layer, right? It has the business rules or all of them, right? All the business rules are inside it. And again, I don't recommend that you put anything too technological in it in your architecture. Q orchestration is called architectural components. For example, oh, I'll call it, we talked about logging, right? But calling a cache, calling any other tool, even a database, right? None of that should be in it. None of that should be in it. If you're going to inject it there, right, directly from a technology for it to execute inside, you have to be very careful with that, okay? That technology there, it would need to be totally abstracted, right, so that you can replace it later and it doesn't have an impact on your business, okay? A business layer is a business layer. The ideal is to leave only business in there. Why? Business evolves, and so does technology. If I have a business problem, I have a problem in the business. I have a business error, I have something to adjust in the business. If I have a problem related to technology, I change the technology, and don't mix one thing with the other, otherwise it will be crazy, right? Imagine, I have a specific problem and I keep looking at this problem to see if it happened where, right? A business error, a rate with a different value, well, is this a business error, or is it an error from something technological that failed, that came from somewhere else? Anyway, it caused latency, someone changed it before me, I changed it after. So, like, this needs to be well segmented, okay? Well, let's go. Next layer, also very important, very commonly used, data layer, data layer, right? This is the layer typically responsible for data persistence, not only persistence, right, but also obtaining data. So you put everything in there. Well, it's very common today for us to use ORMs, right? And the ORM itself is often the data layer, right? It already plays that role. And then you have to be a little careful too, as I said, right? If you directly use the ORM in your business, it's a little problematic, okay? Because if you need to change the ORM, right, let's suppose you use it, right, the ORM is used to be able to change the database without having to change it, okay? I agree with you. However, what can happen with the ORM is that it may become obsolete, it may be discontinued, right? And then you may have to put some kind of evolution pet. When I worked with DNet, for example, we used Nibernate for a while, right? And for a specific version there that we evolved from DNet, there was no longer support for that version of Hibernate that we used there. If we migrated Hibernate, or there was a time, in fact, when Hibernate didn't release a new version of it for another version of the framework, we were stuck. So everyone wanted to, needed to apply some new technology there that came with a new framework, right? With a new DNET, we couldn't migrate. Why? 
because the entire system implemented there was stuck, that ORM. So that's a bit of a problem too. We have to be a bit careful too, okay? Well, this substitutability, right, it's important that we have it. Although the ORM is made for that nowadays, right, it's become such an important component that we also have to be careful to keep things, right, at the design level, isolated, to ensure that we won't, right, have such a strong dependence on an architectural component like that, okay? That's why I like frameworks, right? Up to the RM and it's just a shell, actually, right, to call your technologies an abstract, right, all the technologies that you're going to be using within your code. So, it becomes a layer of anti-corruption, right? This framework that I talk about so much here, right, at ARC, it could practically be simply an anti-corruption layer to ensure that we don't have any inference, right, of the technology within our design, of our applied standards. Okay? Well, let's go. So, data layer, of course. Logically, what we're going to have there is data persistence, right, and obtaining data directly, regardless of the technology. Sometimes your architecture has end technologies. Then, for example, some people say, wow, where do you put the cache? In the data layer, right? You can have a segmentation there within the data layer, right? EH, EH, or data, right? People usually talk a lot about the market. So, you can have a cache segmentation, right? Or relational data, okay. Non-relational data, okay? It can all be within the data layer, okay? Regardless of whether it is a more monolithic model or a microcomponent model, it's good that you have this vision, right? The team gets used to this and it's a market model. Everyone uses it this way, okay? Well, let's go. Next layer here, also very common, DTO. What is DTO for? What does DTO mean? In fact, it means it's the name of a standard, okay? It stands for data transfer object. Yes, it's a standard, right, that says that you're going to transfer data in an object. And this has been going on for a long time, actually, okay? Back then, it was common for us to pass from the data layer, right, to other layers a data set that was, right, and continues to be. In fact, there still is, right, an object that comes directly from the native framework, right, from the native frameworks. Well, many tools, right, still have this concept of already having a class there, right, that returns a standard object, right, that has columns, rows and everything else, that it already returns. So, it was common in the past to have a table object, a dataset object, etc., that was often returned by the data layer and then needed to be propagated to other layers. And what was the problem with that? I'm sending a cam an object that is native to a data framework to a business layer. I need to put a reference to the data layer there. And then, if I need to change the data technology, the data tool, whatever, I continue. I'm strongly tied, right, to that technology and I have incorrect code from one that is not the responsibility of that layer, right, and being used, right, that is wrong, right, that shouldn't be there, okay? So this ends up being a problem of good practices, right? Of good practices. So, the correct thing here is for us to have an object being transferred, the ideal, right? Especially speaking of object orientation for a number of reasons, okay? Not only because of the issue here of the data, right, being processed. There are problems here too, okay? There are bugs that can happen. Imagine that you go there and change something in the table. The name of a column, remove a column put another one, the data object being flexible. When it gets there in the data layer, ship, etc., it will be different and will break the code somewhere. Some business rule hidden in some corner can cause a problem, right? So that's where the whole problem lies. That's where the whole thing lies. Okay, that's why we always go for a line of placing a more static object there, right? Being processed between the layers. And that's what it's all about. It's a standard, right? And then it's cool to have this layer. It's a cross layer. What's a cross layer? Stepping is a layer that is and it has contact with all the others. Okay. The layers we've talked about so far, for example, the business layer, I'm not going to make it accessible by all the layers in my architecture. I'm going to put an input layer for it, right? And probably this business layer here, or it will directly call a data layer, a core layer, something like that, right?
or my front layer here that uses the business layer, it will use the business processing and put it in a core. How does it pass the baton from one side to the other? With said. With said. Maybe I have a controller layer here, right? That gets data, feeds data through the business layer. It sends this a zero DTO or receives a DTO, right? Out of nowhere my business generates a DTO, returns it to me, right? With some type of data. Or, for example, I get raw data through a specific DTO, coming from a data layer and submit it to a business for processing, calculation, etc. And then I get this guy and return it, I do it if I'm using a controller, right? As we said at the beginning, to make an output and return. Well, the business can also call a date directly, it can. It depends on your design, right? On the responsibility that you place there in the business, okay? But if it calls a layer, the ideal is that it doesn't have a strong dependency, okay? Very strong coupling, as we said, right? If you have a dependency there on a class to have a specific object from the database present here in the business, it's a very strong dependency, right? Here, the ideal is that you have an interface for the data layer so that you can test this in isolation, right? So that's the ideal, okay? That's the ideal. Well, let's go. Then we have here another layer that is also very common for us to see, right? Called entity. And the entity, it's very similar to the said. Very similar to the said. Okay? Why? Because it's a cross layer too, right? Typically it's at the base, right? All the other layers communicate with it to generate an entity or to obtain data from an entity. The difference is that the entity layer is often part of an ORM, right? And it directly represents a data entity. So it already has the mapping for the table, for example, right? So it already directly represents the data entity. You often use it directly as a persistence layer, right? Well, there are situations and scenarios, right, right, where the architecture is designed for this layer to be an anemic layer, right, and to serve as a 2, right, which is what I'm talking about, DTO, right, DTO, right. So, it can play that role too, that's why it gets confused, right? In fact, it does, right, it is a processing object, the difference is that, in other words, it is literally anemic. It only serves that purpose, to be passed between layers. The entity usually has more responsibility. It usually has stronger references to a framework behind it, right? Or does it connect directly to the database in some way, okay? It has events, it has a mapping, at least that, it has, right, a connection between its properties and what's in the database. Okay, so it's more like that. Not doll, it doesn't have that. What does that for it is another layer, layer D another layer, okay. That's the difference between the entity layer and the entity layer, okay. Well, let's talk about some layers that, in fact, represent a pattern. It's also very common for us to see these layers present, okay? The first one is the facade. The facade is a layer, wow, everyone, we always see this layer being, uh, used in architecture, right? And people often don't know, right, what it's for. Many times it's just a bypass layer, it shouldn't be, okay? The facade layer is a very important layer. It is a layer responsible for the link, right, between all the complexity that we have and the simplicity that I want to deliver to my user, the link between the complexity that I have back there in my application and the simplicity that I want to deliver to my user. What do I mean by that? What did I repeat? I have to put it in a simple way for whoever is going to consume it, right, all the systemic complexity that I have back there. So, back there I have several business classes, maybe I even have controllers, as we said here, I can have a super elaborate architecture, right? And when it comes to delivering this to my consumer class, right, from a large layer, I have to deliver this in a simple way, okay? Imagine you doing, for example, the back end there, an API, right? And here I'm not talking about a web API, right? I'm talking about a systemic API, right? A DLL there, for example, any executable, so that you can integrate a word type application, right? An office package there, integrating it with other applications. There's a desktop application there, right, being integrated with other applications. You're going to build an API for that. 
Wow, imagine how complex it would be for you to do each of those things. A page break, huh, a line break, right? A font change, anything, that you were going to do there in the text editor. It's a lot of work, right, and you would need to use several classes there for that. So, to give an example and also to summarize here, okay? Imagine that a person needs to drive a car, okay? To drive a car, regardless of the technology you have inside it, whether it's carbureted, whether it has eight valves, whether it's turbo or not, right? It has the same interface, it has a steering wheel, right? It has a gear shift, accelerator, brake, right? A clutch is often for manual cars, automatic cars don't have it, but in general the interface is standard, right? We have an interface here that's unique and the same, okay? For any driver, right? Any driver who sits there in the car will be able to drive, right? Why? Because I have an abstraction behind it. When I step on the accelerator, so many things happen in the car, right? And it's different from one car to another. One has electronic injection, and so on. One injects directly from the engine, the other is turbo, right? One is aspirated, another is turbo, and so on, right? But the person who's stepping on the accelerator doesn't care about it. They want to step on the accelerator, the car will go forward, right? Or backward if it's in reverse. That's what they care about. So the facade serves that purpose. It serves to deliver what's written there, right? Look, change the font, change the size, right, and so on, right? So, our entire system, it tends to have a lot of complexity back there, right? In the data layers, in the core business layers, etc. There's a complexity, right, of using there, of combining data between them, sequence of calls. You might even say, wow, I'm working with microcomponentization. But it's still worse, right? Because your front layer, which calls the microservices, needs to know all of this, has to orchestrate all of this. And whoever will consume a front end, for example, probably needs to receive this in a simpler way, okay. So, the facade pattern is for this, it's for you to synthesize the complexity of the calls, right, in a single class, okay. So, or you can organize this in a way, EHEH by functionality. For example, right? It's very linked to functionality, okay? Another very common pattern, especially when using hexagonal architecture, if you use DDD, right, is the use of the factor pattern. What is this pattern for? Literally to apply the design factory pattern, right? In other words, it's a layer that builds other layers. It takes away the complexity of building, right, layers of, for example, data of data structures. It takes away this complexity and executes it. So, oh, gosh, I need to create there, build a person object. Gosh, this person object, it can be an individual or a legal entity. Well, the individual, it can be a client, a supplier, it can be an employee, a legal entity too, it can be a supplier, it can be a client, right? Who is buying from me, right? Well, so it can be an end to end there, right? I can have an end-to-end -end relationship, including after the people. So, to build these objects, even if I don't necessarily use the factory pattern, okay? And the factor has more than one, actually, right? There is the abstract factor, there is the factor method, right? There is also the pattern that is also very commonly used or the builder, right? Which is also a very used pattern, right, to build other objects. Well, any pattern that is creative there, right, to assemble, build object structures, can be inside a factory layer, right, although the name is the same as the pattern there, the factor design pattern, right, it can be used in general to build complex objects, okay, that's what it's for. There shouldn't be a technological association here, right, a link with technologies, I've even seen it in some cases and it even makes sense, right. For example, right, in a migration, right, in a strangle process, right, of an application that was monolithic, using a dataset, right, it already had datasets and everything else there, it started to go through a process of migrating to another technology. Then it made sense, right, to still use a dataset to connect to the database the way it was before and then have a transformation, the factor to assemble the target object. I've also seen that make sense, right? But it's rare, it's rare. Normally, the factor is only used to build objects, right? It has this focus, okay? It doesn't have the focus of technological links, of populating entities with data, right? Of technologies, of any kind, okay?
Other than data lakes, none of that, okay? Well, moving on here, the application layer. This layer is very common when we use DDD, right? It's very common indeed. And in a way, it applies, it makes use of the fade pattern. It's even like this, I've scratched my head a few times, I use application, I use fade as the name of my layer, right? Because the application layer literally gives the connotation there that you have it as if it were your API, right? It's your application layer, it's the layer that delivers all the results back to your application, okay? So I think it's even more elegant than the facade as a name, although the face makes it clear, right? I'm using this pattern, so I'm delivering here what is simplest for applications to connect to my core, okay? However, again, I repeat here that the application, right, is much more common when we have a modular architecture, right, all modularized, segmented. Or when we use DDD, it is also very common, right, it creates a link between the domains, right, it serves that purpose too, right? It synthesizes this complexity of the domains, right, the entire modal complexity that we have in business. Well, so it takes care of all this modularization and delivers it in a simpler way, right? Whoever is consuming the business does not necessarily need to know that it is segmented into modules, that I have departments or that I have domain A, B, C, D. So, the application serves that purpose, right? To represent a limit there, right, between what is effective, the application, right, the entire core of the business as a whole, right, not just the core layer, the core of the entire business and a front end, for example, right? From an application, it is very common for you to have services, right? I can have a service there exposing my application, right? The service is the entry point of my application. I can literally have a front end, the front end there directly from an application, EH forms, right? A desktop or mobile application, EH, directly accessing an application, right? It's common. I can have the application being used directly by a service type layer something like that, or EH that represents, right, literally your API, okay. And again, I'm not talking about web API, it could be too, okay, of any type of service, okay? So, the application normally has this and is used more in this context of modularization, right, of using modules, of using business segmentation directly, okay. On the face of it, I, I would say that the biggest difference between them is that the application, it literally has more of this connotation of being the last layer, right, of our back end. And the facade is not necessarily, right? Sometimes I could have a facade there even in the data layer, right? Have a facade back there in the data that summarizes the use of the data layer. Maybe there is a complexity there between more than one transactional model. There is the non-relational database or I have one with eventual consistency. The other strong and then I need to orchestrate this complexity. I put a facade there so as not to push this further down the line. Yes, it is a possibility, okay? After all, right, facade is a pattern, okay? That can be applied to any tier of our application, okay? Oh, by the way, if you are enjoying this content, don't forget to leave a like for us here, a little heart, depending on what you have on the platform, right, that you are following us. And we have content on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, about layers and tiers, okay? If you have any questions about, when I'm talking about layers and tiers here, huh? It will be clearer for you watching this content, okay? Let's go, next layer. Wow, we're almost at the end, it's the service layer. Well, what is this layer for? Typically, it represents a service, right? So, it could be the last layer of a microservice, an API, a BFF. We also have content on our channel talking about the difference between all of this. Well, but it's typically the last layer of a micro component like this or of a large component, right? It could be a large service, right? A service that does many things, right? Not a microservice, right? Large, right? It could be web or not. And this service, its last layer is the service, right? Well, depending on the service, if it's a bet service, for example, and it can also be, I've seen in the application of the service layer for this. But it's also common for you to have a layer, right, control, which is it, it controls, for example, start and stop, it's a bonus here, it wasn't on our list of layers, but here's another one for our little list here, okay? It can be used for that too, okay? So, it's a slightly simpler layer, right? 
It literally creates the systemic interface there. We talked about the application layer, right? When I'm talking about a micro-componentized application, then it's rare to see an application layer for an IP. For example, it's rare, right? It's rare. For a more monolithic application, then it's more common, okay? As for fade, look, another difference from back then, we also have the facade, and in a way it's common for microservices too. I see many applications with microservices that have a facade layer for something, okay? To summarize, right, some complexity, okay? Well, let's go. Let's move on to the next layer here. Wow, the domain layer. Logically, this layer here, it's used in architectures, right, that use DDD. Well, I don't even need to say that the ideal here is to apply DDD by the book, right? Apply DDD correctly, otherwise you won't get the benefits from it, okay? You really need to segment the bounded contact there, right? Start there, right? One of the most important things, Eric Evans himself talks about this a lot. Well, you have to start there, right? You have to do it right there, understand the domains where they are, right? Which bounded context does it belong to, right? Their relationship, how it works, right? Upstream, downstream, you have to determine everything right, right? So I always recommend following DDD right, right? Using DDD simply as a layer to say that you have an application using DDD. That's not true. That's not true, right? And it also doesn't bring the benefits of DDD, right? You could have used the DDD architectural pattern, which is yes, right? Having a domain layer there, a layer, right? Within domains, you can have val objects, you can have entities and so on, right? But often when we observe, right, this use, the use of this layer, we don't even have the outermost layer there, which is the delimited contexts, right? There's no bounded contact there, there's no clear view of this segmentation, so this is a problem, okay? And again, look, I'm going to work with DDD. I know this content is not about that, but gosh, it's a more complex business, okay? We have to have a domain expert, we have to have these discussions, right, of the terms that will be used, to have the Ubica language working properly, okay? So, all of this is necessary, okay? If we do the business anyhow here, ah, uh, it doesn't work well. So, the domain layer normally, right, and in the DDD application, right, and it's the main layer, right, it's the layer where all the business rules are, often there's a factory here too for building the domains, right, which often have mega complex domains to be built, right. So we have all of this in this layer, okay? Well, is it possible to have an application that doesn't use DDD and has the domain layer? Yes. Maybe I have a company, right, that has a certain segmentation of areas, right, and I call it, ah, I have a business domain here, right, there is a clear segmentation, there is a very clear business entity here. I have my product, I have my client, I have my domains here, right, the way I segment my business. So, I have my domains, I have my cases here on top of my domains, yes, it is possible, okay, it is possible. I have seen architectures like this that did not use and did not have the purpose of using DDD, right? But that segmented it this way to benefit from a more elegant implementation, I would say, with inversion of control, right? More disconnected, with less coupling, right? Greater cohesion. By the way, this is one of the golden rules, right, of a good architecture. So, I've also seen this form of implementation. Okay, let's go to our penultimate layer, the integration layer. This is a layer that is also very common to be observed, right, in architectures. It is responsible for integration, right? Basically, integration, what? Pison, integration of my APIs. No, it is usually integration of my system with another application, right? So, there is a layer back there that disconnects, right, my application from other applications. I create one there as if it were an anti-corruption layer, right? Let me tell you if the pass-through is also a layer, right? In fact, this layer is little used. It's not here on our list, right? It is little used. It should be more, right? It is a layer that prevents you from having to change the code on one side or the other, especially when the one who demands changes, right? The one who can demand changes is something external. Ah, the case of integration is one of them, right? So, for example, maybe I have an integration that is necessary with the post office, right? To load data from the post office into my application. However, I don't want to, for example, be susceptible to seeing, oh, gosh, the post office integration API has changed. I have to change a lot of things in my code, right? I have an integration layer that does this, right? 
And I have interfaces here that abstract this connectivity that I have. So, I have interfaces here that abstract the connection that I have with this layer and this layer with the final technology, okay? Many times we deal with issues here such as monitoring the number of integrations that I can do. Maybe I have an integration with a paid service, right, with some tool and I have a limit, I need to trigger a warning when I'm getting close to a limit and I want to control this via the application. Maybe I have a rate limit, what's that, Pizen, rate limit. Volume of requests, right? Some people call it flow control, right? A very large volume of requests at what rate can I respond per second? So this is a rate limit, right? The number of requests that I can send or support per minute in my integration, okay? Well, I said there that we normally don't provide integration, right, at the layer. In fact, when we provide integrations too, yeah, I like it, okay. I mentioned this point at the beginning, but it's not necessarily for an API. <laughs> from an API to my front end, okay? Well, there are people who put it there. Gosh, I have an integration architecture. There is an integration layer. There is an integration framework. There is an integration framework. Everything has to go through it. Even a call from my Pi, right? From my front end there, which may be a mobile application, right? For my Pi, no, right? It doesn't make sense, right? My mobile application here directly calls a BFF or it can also call an API directly, right? But in a lighter way, Maybe using a lightweight SB bus here, right? Well, anyway, I also don't like to put a service bus to be a backend, okay? That's cool, I like it more, I prefer it, okay. Well, still because conceptually the ideal is for the connection between the front end and the back end to be made directly, right? Not to have an intermediary here in the middle. You can already have a security layer, of course, but it's an orchestration layer there in the middle. But you're not going to literally put a tool here that has all the control over rate limits, monetization, and many other things for the back end. It doesn't make much sense. I don't know that architecture really requires this. Okay? There's no perfect rule here, okay? Each architecture is different. Each system needs a different architecture, a different design. That's why the role of the architect is increasingly important. Okay, let's go back. So, the integration layer, the integration, right, it serves all of this, okay? And it's also responsible for preventing failures in our system. If there's a problem with an integration, I can somehow alert some monitoring tool, but I don't take down my entire application, okay? I don't let my entire application fail. I leave it in a failed state or put it in a queue to do the integration later, right? I do some kind of control this way, but I keep it isolated from my application. I don't let it keep giving errors in my application because of an external integration failure, the internet went down, etc. Okay? Well, the last layer, right, that we brought here is utilities, which is also very common, we see it in several architectures. Here we usually put layers, EH components, right? That tend to be a framework, a to-do kit, right, that can be used by several other layers of that tier, right, layers of that tier. So, maybe I have, gosh, in the data layer there, I have this base. The base would be in the to-do layer, right? But I don't know, I could have something here that would help to do some kind of validation of the do. EH, maybe I have validations there of age is greater or lesser, right? Used in several places, I can unify this in a little point, right? Well, then you'll say, wow, but isn't that a business rule? Yes, but maybe I need this in more than one layer. And then dividing the code, putting this code in several places is bad. Then I could have a utility, right? That would be cross-platform there and everyone could benefit from having to use and access this utility layer, okay? So, any auxiliary logic that complements my architecture, I can apply it there in this utility layer. Okay? Well, guys, that's it. If you have any additional questions about this content, any additional layer that we didn't talk about here, leave them here in the content. The more interaction you have with this content, the more we'll make content like this here in the AR cast format, too, right? Well, we'll, of course, make some cuts of this content with some examples as well. Anyway, I'm going to ask you for feedback. If you liked it, leave a like for us to help our channel reach more and more people who, like you, want to become an ARC, an AR expert, okay? So I'll leave it here, ARC, a big hug and see you next time.